All right, that should work. All right, let's go ahead and get underway. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the April edition of the Roundtable. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing. I'm joined here by my colleagues, Kim Butcher, Ken Cavula, and Nick Stratagos. And uh, we are basically uh, celebrating end games and probably even more celebrating winter ending for any Game of Thrones fans. Um, that's on on its way to an interesting outcome. I'll, I won't do any spoilers, but uh, winter is close to ending. And that's always good for fans of Punxsutawney Phil also. And uh, so, again, no costumes were actually uh, donned to, to make the cover photo, and that, that is not Photoshopped. Um, so are, are you okay with that, Ken? Are you comfortable enough to... I, I'm comfortable with that. I didn't have to pull on any tights or anything, I, so we're all set. We're, we're comfortable that you didn't have to do that either. I mean, I don't okay, know what's going on. <laughs> but once again, we, we put Kim in the anatomically correct one, and... and uh, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. Hey, and I'm from the Steel City, and you put me in Iron Man. Yeah, that's right. You probably did that by accident, but it just worked out that way. Oh, man, the Iron Man. Good stuff. All right, let's get underway. Uh, one of the questions that we do get before we get the official paperwork underway is, uh, you know, who are these people and why are they here? Well, this is a just a list of one of our favorite things. We run stock picking contests, a lot of chapters at Better Investing do this, and uh, this is one that we have run now for, uh, we're in our 13th year at Manifest Investing, where you can pick five to 20 stocks, see how they do, but we keep track of the performance year in and year out, and what you're looking at here is the all-time leaderboard, and uh, on the far right-hand column, you can see how many years these participants have been involved. Uh, our all-time leader is a group of lovely ladies and one guy from St. Louis named the Broad Assets. And they're actually a three-time winner of the contest. And uh, they've generated a, almost a 29% return. That's beating the market by 16 percentage points over those seven years. So we actually uh, are fairly interested in hearing, you know, what their ideas are every year. And just working down the list, you can see that everybody that's here tonight is on this list. That means we have all beaten the market during our period of participation. You see Iron Man from Pittsburgh down there. He's in, on here in a couple of different ways. Number seven is his investment club in Pittsburgh, and his own personal entry is 14. That, that means your partners are better than you, Nick. <laughs> well, I've been at it a little longer, too. There you go. And uh, Kim is there in the number six slot. So, again, we are people who have been working in the realm of investment club-based education of investors uh, for more decades than we care to count, and uh, uh, that's what we like to do. So that is the purpose of what we do here at the Roundtable is attempt to share ideas and um, methods and madness and just have some fun while we are exploring the realm of investing. And you can just going down the list, you can see Hughes on the list, so is Cy. Um, Susan Michalek out of Janesville, Wisconsin, is checks in at number 13. That's her investment club, Bauer City. Ann Manning out of Houston won the Groundhog one year, but more importantly, her performance year in and year out for 10 years is pretty spectacular. And uh, again, so that's that's why we do come together and uh, and do this stuff. Any comments from anybody on the the all-time leaderboard? I didn't know I had a return of 19.3. I'm having a big grin on my face. <laughs> well, that's that's a ka-ching moment, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. All right, let's press on. Here, we'll get the official paperwork out of the way. No investment recommendation whatsoever is intended by anything that we do. We come together and do this uh, to share um, ideas, methods, techniques. It's all about education. It's all about illustration and demonstration. And uh, you are directed to do your own homework. Don't just rush out and buy something because we talk about it. Um, if you'd like to have, if you're a family member or a friend, receive reminders to th these uh, educational events. We usually have one or two per month. We do this on a monthly basis, the round table. You can write to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you have uh, questions or want copies of the slides, mark R at manifestinvesting.com. So let's just keep trucking on. Here is our standing agenda. Again, um, 
Welcome to those of you who may be joining us for the first time. We try to keep this fairly informal. Um, we do monitor for questions. We do monitor for hands raised in the air. If you've got audio equipment on your end, you can actually speak to the audience. And we do watch for questions and, and, and that kind of stuff. We do measure our results. We'll talk about the performance here in a few minutes. Um, everything that we do is done in the mode of long-term perspectives. That's the, the mode of investment club operations to always be thinking long-term. We'll talk about a few challenges to the portfolio. And there are four stocks to be presented tonight from Ameritrade to Cabot Microelectronics to CorePoint Lodging. And I'll wrap things up with Supernus Pharma. We do poll at the end for um, the audience gets a vote and makes a decision. And then we do try to leave time for Q&A. We've got a lot to cover here tonight, so we will be rolling along pr fairly, fairly lively. But again, end game, for those of you that have seen it, uh, I'm hearing that it's pretty good stuff. I want to see it here pretty soon. It's, it has absolutely obliterated the records for box office performance over these first few days. And I was just pleased that the definition of Endgame has a knight in it at the bottom of the page there. All right, just as a quick reminder, we are here to talk about a, a demonstration of techniques, methods, and philosophies. Um, we will be talking about an idea from each one of us. It ranks among our single favorite ideas at this time. We do keep track of what we do. Our objective is to beat the long-term performance of the stock market by five percentage points. We measure that against the Wilshire 5000. We'd also like to see at least half, hopefully 60% of our selections, beat the market, uh, mirroring investment in the market versus every single decision or selection that is made. Well, here's the a moment of fanfare. Thanks to the performance of Microsoft, Apple, Qualcomm, and a few others this past month, um, we have zoomed to an all-time high. We are tracking right around 18% for annualized performance, uh, rate of return since inception. That's almost nine years ago now. It was back in 2010 when we started this. The stock market over that period of time is now back to 9.9%. That means the relative return, and that's what you see graphed on this chart, is now 7.9, just short of 8% percentage points, better than the Wilshire 5000. And again, the long-term goal of most investment clubs is to beat the market by 15% over the long term. That really shakes down to achieving a 15% return when the average for stocks is about 10% over most long-term time horizons. So uh, we are operating comfortably north or above that, uh, that red objective line, and we're thrilled to be there, hope to stay there. Any comments or questions, Ken? I just like the fact that uh, the Wiltshire is is mirroring what we've known the stock market to do for for decades. Uh, it's hovering, you know, between nine and eleven percent. There's that ten percent return over the last nine years. Uh, that's a pretty decent number. And I know that as I uh, go to different uh, sessions with different groups of people, sometimes I'm challenged as to whether that number is still holding uh, for. Uh, the modern market, and well, it's held, it's holding for this particular market for the last nine years at least. Yeah, right around Christmas Eve, it was hard to make a point for ten percent, but it's recovered. So back. Yeah. All right, and as as you can see there, our our performance accuracy that's simply measuring the performance of every single individual decision or selection versus a a mirroring investment. Well, now we're up to almost fifty six percent of those. Um, beating the market also, and that's that's just fun. I mean, that's coming from again places like Microsoft and Qualcomm, and and you'll see the portfolio here in a second. I imagine, Mark, it's pretty fun talking to your friends who are rhinos, and you're telling them our returns, and they're looking at you like, what? It actually is a lot of fun, and we don't have time to go into it now, but for the third time in probably five or six years, I had one of those you know, nose-to-nose -nose conversations with a professional investor who insists that individual investors like us can't do this. And uh, it's, just, it's just a lot of fun to see them squirm, especially <laughs> since, uh, you know, you take any investment club with, with Bivio or iClub uh, performance accounting, it's all right there. 
you know, and it's just a lot of fun to, well, here, here's this, you know, you can run the numbers yourself. Very cool. Thanks. All right, here's the top 20 holdings in the portfolio, ranked from the largest position down to the number 20 position. I think there's about 80 total positions in the tracking portfolio now. The legend up at the top, uh, first of all, that link anybody in the audience can get to. You do not have to be a subscriber to Manifest Investing to do that. But the legend at the top shows the number of times that a uh, position has been selected by a knight, a damsel, or the audience. We'll put $1,000 into each one when that happens. As you can see, the the number of um, investments into Cognizant technology is 15. That means $15,000 has been invested in Cognizant. That $15,000 is now worth $25,478. So you can break down the code for any one of these. One of our favorites to point out is Hugh McManus and his Amazon. Two single uh, selections of Amazon are now worth 13, almost $13,200. So that's $2,000 becoming that. So again, one of our favorite things to notice is the, the selections that have only been made a couple of times like S&P Global that are climbing up this chart and uh, just knocking things out of the park. Gentex, not Gentex, uh, Ulta Beauty was actually featured as the top performing investment in the S&P 500 over the last 10 years, and it's been part of the the roundtable portfolio for much of that. How many times do we have Alta selected? It's seven oh. times, Mark. Yep, and we had to be very patient. Uh, uh, most of you probably remember uh, an extended period of time spent down around 200, and uh, all of a sudden it's back at 351. And that's fun. Any comments on this from any of you? Well, it certainly makes a nice portfolio, just these 20 stocks. Uh, uh, you can vision the whole portfolio uh, if you're a Manifest subscriber right off the front page. Uh, over on the right side, it talks about other portfolios, and the round table is sitting right there on the front page. Just click it, and you can see the entire portfolio, not just the top 20. All right, let's keep pressing on because we do have a fairly – fairly uh, ambitious schedule here tonight. Here's our quick reminder of how rapidly the recovery has happened since uh, Christmas Eve. You can see that huge dive in the stock market that happened in the fourth quarter when, again, everybody on TV was telling us to run for the hills and panicking. Uh, we know it's just simply a good time to go shopping. How do we know that? Because the average stock back in that time frame was actually at, at multi-year highs when it came to the return forecast. That's how we keep our sanity when everybody else is losing theirs. Um, and, and again, uh, it was kind of a, a back up the truck moment. Maybe the, the the small bed truck, but it was still a back up the truck moment in no, uh, well November and December, and that's how we thought about it. So again, fairly sudden recovery and uh, nasty moment that's now in the rearview mirror. Let's talk a little bit about uh, challenges to the portfolio. We have some selling disciplines that we try to follow for the tracking portfolio that, are emulate, that emulate the type of stuff you would do for a conventional portfolio with the caveat that this is a tracking portfolio. It's got a lot of issues, a lot of positions in it, and so it is treated a little bit differently. But we actually keep score the same way. When something is, uh, is sold from the portfolio, it, it just becomes part of the cash flow over time. And what you see here is, uh, again, George Nicholson taught us that most of the portfolio decisions you make with respect to a portfolio will be an opportunity to sell a hot, well-performing stock at a low return forecast and replace it with something that makes the overall portfolio better. And uh, what you're looking at here are the five lowest return forecast stocks in the portfolio. And again, I'd we talked about this last month, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but numbers two through five are all very high-quality companies that we would probably only really think about selling when uh, the return forecast for them approach money market rates. Or, as is shown in the illustration down below, that's the five-year yield on the U.S. Treasury, you know, something down in that 2% range, and they're not there. They're not quite there, even though they've all been pretty hot including Universal Display. Now, Qualcomm is a special case. We'll talk about that. 
um, the return forecast based on uh, the analyst estimates over the last several weeks is actually negative now. It's actually shot up, I believe, from 50-ish to nearly 90 in a matter of a few weeks. And uh, that's actually been a lot of fun, very rewarding for us. So we'll take a closer look at Qualcomm, where it is today, why it's, why it's doing what it's doing. But unless there's any disagreement, I don't see any reason to uh, set any of these free, including Qualcomm, after we take a closer look. I agree. I, I would like to allow the, the thundering herd to catch up uh, to Qualcomm before I make any firm decisions about it. I know that the manifest numbers are based on the analyst community, and I don't think that the bulk of the analyst community has had time to reevaluate the, the idea that Qualcomm is no longer uh, doing deep legal pressure as far as Apple's concerned. So. Uh, let's leave it for at least a month, if not longer. Okay, yeah, we got to let the analysts catch up. So here's a closer look at what's going on. You can see the the turbulence, the, the top line uh, picture up at, at Qualcomm has been pretty flat. They've been struggling with some of their royalty conditions. Um, as recently as mid-March, we were looking at the average analyst looking for low single-digit growth rates, Margins dropping down into the 20 range and PEs, you know, getting down into the low teens also. And that's what actually produces that negative 1.5% uh, projected return. Um, if you update the numbers to what uh, some of them are beginning to reshape their thinking now, uh, we're probably looking at double-digit return forecasts as some of this stuff starts to recover. And uh, I, I, as Ken was just saying, I think we give it a little bit of time. Who knows, we may actually still end up with a, a selling condition depending on where it ends up. But here's a, here's a look at some of the details. This is from a value line supplementary report from just a few days ago as to what actually happened at Qualcomm. If you're not familiar, they settled uh, a vicious um, litigation with Apple that involved $8 billion. And uh, not only did they settle that, they came out with a six-year license contract to provide Apple with modems. And uh, that alone injected $2 into the bottom line. So we have to let Rhino Nation catch up to uh, some of those realities. But it, it really is pretty uh, affirming. And uh, the foundations are there for Qualcomm, Qualcomm because... Uh, there were some people questioning whether they should be getting paid the royalties that they've been getting, and you can see in that bottom paragraph that's what that suggests. So let's see what the rhinos actually come up with. Well, you know, Mark, I've been reading Value Line for years, uh, and uh, this Value Line here is almost giddy uh, in its language when you compare it to the normal kind of language that comes out of a Value Line analyst. I mean, this is still fairly restrained in language. But uh, there, it's a very, very positive, especially the last uh, paragraph is extremely positive uh, about the future. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm almost tempted to collect up uh, a dozen or so sell recommendations that I could get from just a couple of weeks ago if I wanted to be nasty. <laughs> well, so anyhow, we'll just, we'll just let Qualcomm roll and just be grateful. For uh, it, it has actually accounted for a pretty good chunk of that uptick in performance in the overall portfolio. All right, the other thing that we monitor for, and this is something we have discussed at some length, we kind of want to table this tonight um, and not talk too much about it. We're just going to make a decision to uh, when a stock falls more than 20% behind the stock market since the time we selected it, we are going to give it a timeout and sell that position. And uh, the only exception on here is Artelex. That has a, an exception as a very, very special situation brought to us by you. Uh, we expect to see a major FDA ruling. Did, I think, did he say by the end of September, Ken? He, he said sometime at the end of the summer or no later than September. Uh huh. I thought it was the end of June. I, would, yeah, I actually thought it was July, so we're all over the place on. Yeah, I, I know it originally was July, but somebody did say something about it, it could roll into September very easily. So yeah. that, that this one gets a special uh, exemption from this rule 
but we will give it a hard look in the fourth quarter if uh, there isn't recovery. By the way, it's up from $2 around Christmas time, so it's actually done pretty well since Christmas, and we have several positions in the company. But the other ones are going to be sold, and I'll, I'll just bear my soul a little bit. I mean, a month ago, we talked about the one at the top, HIIQ, Health Insurance Innovations. I think it's a great company, and it's had a great run. It was number one on that Fortune fastest-growing company list or whatever. But uh, a month ago, it had gone down like 7% in a day, and by the time we had the roundtable session, it, it had gone up 8%. And I said, well, it doesn't even qualify for this list anymore. And uh, lo and behold, it lost 20% since the last roundtable, An another 20% since the last roundtable. And there have been so many times, I mean, we can point to questions that we've asked about Alliance Data, uh, CVS Health. We've kind of ignored and let it sit there at a 25 or 30% uh, negative comparison to the market. And I, I think we just have to, you know, take the emotion out of it. Uh, and, and walk away from these, give them their real time out, and uh, I think we come back later and debate whether or not it was a good thing to do or not. But so far, my personal experience with several case studies like the HIIQ situation, where we didn't pull the trigger and the next thing you know, we are really regretting it. I, I think we just leave it at that. We sell these and just move on. There are plenty of positions in the portfolio. And the only thing that I want to add, Mark, is that uh, we, we started talking about this whole procedure about two years ago, and the whole purpose was to try to wring some of the emotion out of some of these stocks that we really liked, but they just weren't performing the way that we that our analysis suggested they might. And we were trying to wring some of the emotion out of it, and uh, maybe uh, you're absolutely right. Let's just go ahead and do it. This is an imaginary uh, set of stocks. We We do like to keep our numbers up there, but... Uh, if we're going to discover different ways of managing past some of the tried and true, then uh, we have to give the give the whole experiment enough time and enough examples so that we can measure what's really happening. Yeah, and I think we'll just leave it at that. I mean, I think CVS Health is still a great company. They are trying a massive uh, transformation. And the day may come in the not too distant future where we put CVS Health, you know, we basically reaccumulate some positions. But for now, um, much like my two-year-old or four-year-old grandsons, they they just need a timeout. Well, it's you, me, and the audience on CVS Health, Mark. So. Yep, yep. Well, there's there's blame to go around, but I've got more yeah. than a fair share of these at the top, so we'll leave it at that. Any questions or comments at this point, Ken? No, we're keeping up pretty well, Mark. All right, so let's go ahead and, uh, again, our special guest tonight, Mr. Stratagos from Pittsburgh. Um, why don't you take us away with TD Ameritrade? Okay, okay so go ahead and give me a slide forward. When I was asked to do this, um, I first thing I did was I went to do a quick search uh, in Manifest, and I have a little one that I've put together, uh, like a do-it-yourself search that I run called My Interpretation of Basic and Fast. And basically, when you look at that, you see that I have three criteria on the side. I want a par that's typically within the sweet spot, and, and I even go above the sweet spot to 24 to give me the opportunity to see if there might be any opportunities that are just above the sweet spot that may be interesting studies. I also want to make sure I have high quality companies. And because I want them to be fast growers, I look for between a 10 and a 15% uh, growth rate. So those are the criteria I put in. It brought me to this list. I, did set, I sorted it by par. And for tonight, I decided to stay away from the yellows. And my first one under the yellow was Jazz. Uh, but I'm no Hugh McManus, so I don't want to try to do a pharmaceutical company. So I went one step further down and decided to go with TD Ameritrade a company I know all too well. I have six or seven accounts with them. My investment club works with them. I think our two Pittsburgh model clubs also work with them. So go ahead, Mark, the next slide. So this is what TD Ameritrade is all about. This is their basic uh, core principle about what they want to do. They want to trans they're striving to transform lives and investing for the better. They do this by providing several different types of services. 
the one that we all know about, of course, is the is the investing services. They provide the the platform for us to buy and sell our stocks in our portfolios. They also have come online in the last maybe year and a half, two years, with a huge amount of education, including some real time live education opportunities you can sit and watch with. They have over 11 million client accounts that handle about 1.3 trillion dollars in assets. Beyond the typical accounts that you and I are used to using, they also offer custodial services to over 7,000 registered investment advisors. They have a platform called Advisor Pro or something like that, where if you are an independent advisor and need someone to custody the assets of your clients, as well as manages, managing their trades, they offer this to the, to the registered investment advisors. They manage about 850,000 trades per day. And you know as well as I do that that's $7.95 every time they make a trade. And what's even more exciting is that more than 25% of these trades are done from mobile devices. So let's go ahead, Mark, let's move forward. Of course, I went ahead and looked, uh, pulled the value line to see what it was, and I was kind of excited because at first glance I thought, man, I think this might be a triple play. So go ahead, Mark, go ahead one slide. And if you recall, our triple play happens to come from Mr. Nicholson, the grandfather of the investment club movement. And he tells us that there's a chance that if there's these three conditions exist, it could be a chance to have a significant returns. First condition is the depressed price of the stock and it can return to normal. The second is the profit margins are gonna be able to increase and that'll work to increase the earnings per share and then a higher price. And then also that there might be PE expansion from the PE ratio. So let's go ahead forward, Mark, and I'll show you how I found that this was a triple play. Uh, we look for the depressed price of the stock in our value line by really evaluating two things quickly, just by a quick look at it. The annual return box has high 23, low 12. Typically, if I see something there that's that's in the hot, the mid to high teens on the low side, that tells me that there's a real good chance that this is a depressed price. The other is that the graph tells me too that when it's the, the numbers are below the value line, it tells me that this could also be a situation where there's a depressed price of the stock. Let's go to the next one where we look at this condition number two. The increased profit margins can produce an increased earnings per share. Well, value line sure as heck thinks that this net profit margin can expand significantly, like by by 30%. Currently, it's running in the mid-20s, and they even think in the next year, in 2018, uh, it could go up as high as the mid-30s and even then get close to uh, 40 for a year and then settle down to the mid-30s. So there's pretty significant opportunity, at least in value line's opinion, for increased profit margins. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, the third condition is that the PE ratio can improve. Well, the place to there look there is at the top, they give you the current PE based on the date of the, of the value line. In this case, it was April 12th, I believe, uh, 13 and a half. The average PE over time is 20. So that tells me there is a significant opportunity for the value of the PE to increase. So all three conditions exist. So this is a very good stock to, to start a study with. So go ahead, Mark. I wanted to show you this because it gives you, they don't really have a nice uh, investor presentation on their website. So I thought to show how the company makes money, I show you the top part of their income statement. They actually have two core streams of revenue. The first one is the transaction-based revenue. And again, that's what you and I all know when we buy and sell our stocks, when we pay a commission, that generates $487 million in the March quarter. They also have asset-based revenues. They actually manage money market accounts that have check writing authority uh, for, the, for personal accounts, for investment accounts, for retirees, all of those sort of things. So in, in that respect, they have uh, operations like a bank. So they get account fees from running the bank accounts, if you will. They also have the net interest revenue. Again, they are the custodian of an awful lot of assets, $1.3 billion under management with TD Ameritrade. They're able to take the, the free cash, the cash that sits in these bank-like accounts, and invest that and get 
a return on that, and then they pay, obviously they pay a return to the investments, uh, to the cash type accounts, and they're able to keep the difference between what they can earn in the marketplace, that drives their net interest revenue. And then the last one under the asset-based revenues is the investment product fees. These are the fees that come from those uh, registered investment advisors who manage their accounts through TD Ameritrade. So those products and those mutual funds that are held in those accounts, as well as the stocks generate fees for TD Ameritrade. So those are the two basic areas where they're able to generate revenue. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, here's a quick highlight. Uh, the, the value line had only gotten to quarter one. The quarter two highlights came out after value line was released. But here's some quick highlights of where they're at. Uh, this, the EPS, 89 cents, was up 85% year over year. They have an average number of client trades per day of 860,000, 1.5 billion in net revenues, which is a 2% increase year over year. They had got $20 billion of new client assets, which annualizes about a 7% growth rate. Good to know when we're looking at making our judgment on growth. As I said, they have 1.3 trillion in assets. That's a 9% increase year over year. Their fee-based investment balances are up to 286. These are the assets under management with the, with the advisors. And they have 150 billion in the interest rate sensitive assets and that's what generates the net interest revenue. So go ahead, Mark, next slide. Looking at the trends, again, they have about 860,000 uh, trades per day. They, the bounce is up and down, and you can see this, this company has a September 30 year end. So fiscal 19 first quarter was actually that fourth quarter of the year when, when everything was going down. So they had a whole lot more trades, and I'm sure that that was driven by the fact that the market was, was tanking during that fourth quarter. So now it's back to their more average, about 850,000 trades per day. Uh, their new client assets came in. Uh, one thing that happened is that they went through a merger with uh, Scott Trade, and that brought in a whole bunch of new assets, and they continued to leverage that relationship to bring in even more new assets. Uh, and you can see their total client assets again, that first quarter, that significant drop, I'm sure as I'm sitting here, uh, that's due to the fact that the market fell so much in that fourth quarter. So the 1.3 down to 1.1, back up to 1.3, really represents the same action you would see if you looked at the, looked at any S&P chart or any Wilshire chart or anything like that. So go ahead, Mark. A couple of things that I wanted to just call your attention to in the value line. Uh, the first quarter, they more than doubled year over year. Uh, their most recent performance was spurred by a net new client activity, which was a 20% growth we've talked about. Uh, they're really well positioned for their near-term growth, uh, really coming from leveraging the inter integration of the Scott Trade. That's one of the areas too, because of that integration with Scott Trade, that's going to drive some of those margin improvements. They're going to be able to, to recognize uh, economies of scale, probably with backroom things and that related and technology, uh, and also drive some productivity improvements. So that that leverage coming from that integration is really going to drive those margins. And then I really liked in the last paragraph how they say they're not just favorably ranked for now, but they're also ranked for uh, near and long-term appreciation. And they do pay a dividend, and they expect that the dividends are going to continue to increase. So as those dividends increase, that's only going to enhance the returns you're going to be able to get. So go ahead, Mark. So let's talk SSG. I've, I've added a line at the top there. That's the total assets. We've already seen where the total assets spiked up uh, during the 2017 fiscal year. That was the acquisition of the Scott trade. You can also see then the results on the top line sales on the green line, the big jump there. Uh, and you can also see the big jump. The, 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 what I really like is the coordinating big jump, not only in the sales, but also in the pre-tax profit and in the earnings. So they were not only able to integrate them and drive more sales dollars, but they were able to do it in a productive way that brought the money down to the, to the shareholders at the bottom line through earnings per share. So those growth rates were, were super high in, from 17 to 18, and they continued into 18 now for the first two quarters. They continue to grow. The, the actual top line revenues have started to slow down back to a little more normal pace of around 8%, but these, these margin improvements are continue to grow and help to, to expand those margins and drive more to the bottom line. Uh, so go ahead, Mark, move ahead. When I looked at the data, uh, I looked at a couple of other sites. 
Uh, value line has growth rates going to be around uh, 7% uh, on the sales side. Most of the places that I looked at for earnings, Yahoo Finance, NASDAQ, uh, Morningstar, they were talking about earnings per share growth rates in the mid-teens. When I went through my preferred procedure and, and, and incorporated those margin increases, I came up with about a 9.2% return. From a management standpoint, uh, right now the pre-tax profit on sales is showing a red, but that doesn't concern me because that's really reflective of the this first steps of integrating the um, the the Scott trade into their business, and so I really expect that those pre-tax profits are going to continue back and get more like the 40, 41, 42 percent that they were just a couple of years ago. Return on equity is good. Uh, debt to capital is fine for a company that's a finance company that runs part of their business like a bank. That's okay. And the average return on assets is strong, being in the high threes, averaging in the, in the low threes over the last couple of years. So go ahead, Mark. We wanted to look for PE expansion. Um, right now, the, the value line had 13 and a half. Right now, the price earnings ratio is about 14. It's actually over the past couple of days since I did this, it's up to about 14.9. But you can see there that it's well below the average of 22. And when we look at the five years back, it's never been as low as it is right now. So that again hits right on the triple play where the PE expansion is certainly doable. It certainly should. And the graph below it gives you an idea too where the PEs have been over a much longer time. They haven't been this low for about six years. And they're, so now with the red line marks where the 14, uh, 14 six is right now, it gives you an idea that there truly is an, a great opportunity here for PE expansion. Go ahead, Mark. Well, when I go into Manifest and look at it, it's a high quality company, 94. Uh, the par is 16.3, and I'll talk about my par in a couple of minutes. It's about the same number. What I really liked about it is, is to the right there, you see that uh, it, it gives you a, a quick look at the industry and the sector, the industry being capital markets. TD Ameritrade is right on top. And, and I'll be honest, my investment club recently did a study of this capital market group, and we actually bought the number two, which was number one at the time, uh, Schwab. So those are the one and two, and they're both great companies. And if you get a chance to study Schwab, I would say compare the two of them and see which one matches best for you. I also like the fact that when you get down to the top in the whole financial industry, the only one that's above it is ADS, which is a company that's familiar. It's one that I know Kim brought to the round table uh, last year at Congress and probably at the May meeting. Uh, so they're a high quality company, but TD Ameritrade's right up there in that whole business too. So lots of good things going on, high quality company, great potential return uh, here with Manifest 16.3. Go ahead, Mark, and move on. Uh, also, it's been a high quality company for a long time. It's been above 80 as long as the graph has been around. It's had some dips along the way, but it's, it's certainly moving in the right direction. And now it's into the mid 90s and our par has been bouncing around a little bit. And you can see even here is reflected some way the par where it went down in that fourth quarter of last year. So now we're back up to over 16% over potential return here. Go ahead, Mark. I, yep, right there. Uh, this is my last look. This is my outcome in Section 5. I think that the potential return could be 16.4. It's an awful lot like 16.3. Um, I make the argument sometimes, too, that we're better as better investing investors. We become very knowledgeable about the company, and we become knowledgeable about how the company trades during the course of any year. So if we actually were to, to need to sell the company, we would know when the PE is going to be closer to the high. So I would almost argue, and I make this argument with my club all the time, is that rather than think of in terms of is this a 16 0.4% returner for our portfolio, I would really say I'd split the difference between 16 and 24 and say, is this an 18 or 19% returner? Because we're very knowledgeable. We've done the research. We've done the work. We follow the company. We know where the, where the, the typical range is. So all things in, even at 16.3, this is a great potential return. And I recommend we put this one in the portfolio. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I, I would I would second that. In fact, I think Ken brought Schwab uh, a couple of months ago, and it actually did edge out Ameritrade at the time. But they're a good side by side comparison. Well, absolutely, and I thought about putting this side by side up, but it, I didn't want to take up the time. Yep, yep, we're squeezed for time a little bit tonight, but I think we're doing okay. Ken, are you ready to talk about slurries?
Absolutely. Uh -huh. We're going to talk about Cabot Microelectronics. Uh, I came to this uh, stock uh, when my club did a uh, industry study on semiconductors. Uh, we looked at the industry as defined by Morningstar and came up with the usual culprits, you know, Intel and Taiwan Semi and Texas Instruments and uh, Xilinx and NVIDIA and companies like that. But we also came up with Cabot Microelectronics. And when uh, the person assigned to this company uh, dealt into it a little bit more. We decided that it was kind of a uh, of a strange first cousin to the uh, chip makers, and that it really didn't fit into the industry as we understood it uh, of making chips. Rather, it was providing equipment for the chip makers. It was providing materials to make the chips. So uh, we didn't keep it in the study, but we really liked the company. So I chose to do a little bit deeper dive. First uh, click mark. Uh, you can see that the company is worldwide, a lot of uh, presence in the Americas, in Europe, and in uh, Asia. Uh, and they make money by uh, being the largest supplier of chemical mechanical planarization. Now that CMP is going to be an important acronym in this presentation, so try to keep it uh, up in your mind, and I will explain what CMP is as we, we go on. Uh, they're also the leading global supplier of high purity process chemicals, and we'll see how that fits into CMP. Uh, they're the second largest CMP pad supplier, and we'll talk about that. And what I like is that they supply to almost every semiconductor manufacturer in the world. So they don't play favorites. They don't have a largest customer that, you know, takes up 30 or 40 or 50 percent of their company. They supply to everybody and they have an extremely robust product portfolio, which they're not afraid to grow by acquisitions of companies that fit the mold of what this company uh, does uh, and delivers to its customers. Next slide. Um, their business is divided into two sections. The largest part uh, is their legacy business. That's 85% uh, plus of their revenue. And that's the electronic materials uh, section. And there's that CMP again. Uh, and they're the largest supplier of the CMP polishing slurries and the second largest supplier of pads. If you're making computer chips, and basically their circuits printed on silicon wafers. Uh, then you need to clean these wafers after you've printed the circuit. You need to make sure that the circuits are distinct so you don't have electricity jumping across the small spaces on the circuit. And you have to make sure that every single circuit is receiving the current so that it works the way it's supposed to work. In order to do that, uh, just like if you're building a piece of furniture, you need to sand it down until it's really smooth. Well, in a clean room where you're making silicon wafer chips, then you use slurries. Uh, think of it as grit. Think of it as uh, a solution with very fine particles in it, like a buffing solution that you can use on these wafer chips. And you need something that is flat and has a little bit of texture to it to buff the whole thing out. That's the slurries and the pads. On top of that, the whole process needs chemicals at different stages to clean the slurries off the chips, to prepare the chips to accept the slurries, to put the chips in a position so that they can, so that you won't erase the circuits that are on the chips in the first place. Uh, the whole process is critical to the whole semiconductor manufacturing process. And we all know that uh, in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, uh, the numbers of semiconductors that help us run our life are going to increase uh, uh, tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. 15% of their revenue comes from performance material. And we'll talk about that performance material in just a little bit. Next slide. 
Here is this CMP process, this chemical mecha mechanical planarization process. You can see it's circular, and you can see that at some stages in the process, there's a uh, an icon that says KMG. KMG used to be a separate company, KMG Chemicals, and uh, uh, Cabot is in the process right now of absorbing the uh, chemical company, the KMG Chemical Company, as part of its own company, and they now own uh, the entire portfolio from KMG Chemical. In other words, they've bought the company. Uh, you can see the legacy products from the old chemical uh, Cabot Macroelectronics are down in the right-hand corner in the dotted box, and you can see that there's the slurries and the polishes. So now Cabot Microelectronics is really kind of in charge of the entire process. It provides the chemicals that you need in the different steps, and then it provides the slurries themselves uh, that you need to make this look a little bit cleaner. Next slide, Mark. Uh, I've blown up that little box right there because I really want you to take a look at the chip before and after. And if you click one more time, Mark, I think I've blown that up as well. There it is. You can see, actually see the difference. These are two pictures uh, under a microscope of, of some of the chips, one of them before the CMP process and one of them after the CMP process. You can now make out the circuitry, you can make out the geometry of the situation. You see that all the curved lines in the top example that uh, had residue attached have now been sharpened up so that uh, all of the uh, circuits are going to work the way they were designed to work. And it's really a fantastic thing that you're working on little pieces of silicon uh, that have overlaid on them different chemicals that will conduct electricity. And uh, they're going to do certain logical operations for you. Next slide. Uh, what's going to drive business in the future? Well, the first driver of business will be the shift from 2D to 3D chips. 2D chips are exactly what you would expect. They're in two dimensions. They have their circuits piled in two dimensions, left to right and top to bottom. And you can squeeze uh, just so many onto a chip before the circuits start to touch each other. And once they touch each other, then you no longer have a chip that will do what it's supposed to do. The solution to that problem is to create 3D chips. So not only are we going to stack the surface left to right and top to bottom, but we're going to stack them up and down as well. So there might be two or three or four or 20 different layers on the chip besides left to right and top to bottom. Uh, right now, about 50% of the chips being manufactured are in 2D and about 50% in 3D. And the expectation is that the entire market is going to move to 3D. Uh, as the industry transfer continues, the demand for the slurries is going to begin to uh, increase exponentially. The other thing that's going to drive the market is the intensity of the chips being used. As you squeeze more and more circuits onto the chip, they must be cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And you can see by the graph that the use of uh, slurries and polishing agents is growing at a really, really fast clip. Uh, check out the uh, scale on the left-hand side there. Uh, the clip, the, the, the rate of growth is extremely fast and that rate of growth is not expected to slow down because we're going from 2D to 3D and we're going from a few circuits to many, many circuits on these little tiny silicon chips. Next slide, please. Uh, the pads themselves, you can see the growth in pads over the last four or five years. Uh, there's no doubt that there's a 
a great market out there and that Cabot is occupying the leadership role in this market. Next slide. Uh, the consumable drive is being driven by all kinds of things that you might even not even think about. Uh, the automotive industry, the cloud data storage industry, smartphones, the Internet of Things, all of these things are increasing with memory chips, with advanced logic chips, and with mature logic chips. So the length of the arrow is the rate of increase of these types of chips. And you can see that the numbers of drivers as we move into 2020 and beyond, the numbers of drivers are increasing too, so that we're only going to have a higher and a higher demand for these very basic products needed by all the chip companies to make their chips. Next slide. The 15% of their business that we haven't talked about came directly from KMG, and that is chemicals that uh, increase pipeline performance. Uh, they have discovered a long while ago that were uh, drag-reducing agents, DRAs, DRAs, uh, and those drag reducing agents could be used in pipelines that were transmitting viscous fluids, specifically different types of oil. If you can make the oil flow smoother and faster through the pipeline, then you reduce the cost that the pipeline is taking as far as the amount of money that a gallon of oil uh, is being uh, processed for. Uh, these drag reducing agents add less than 1% to the cost uh, of transporting the oil in a pipeline, uh, but they increase the flow to an extent where there's not a single company running a pipeline that isn't using these drag uh, reducing uh, agents. And the use of the agents doesn't seem to be tied to oil prices at all. In other words, you're going to use these reducing agents whether oil is cheap or whether it's expensive. Next slide. They also make a chemical that treats wood. Uh, most of you grew up knowing the word creosote. Uh, that's what they used to soak telephone poles in to give them life of 30 or 40 years in the ground. Well, that life has now been extended to as much as 50 years. And uh, uh, Cabot uh, makes one of the preservatives. It's called Penta. It has about 45% market share. And it will extend the life of wooden utility poles to around 50 years. And uh, that's a fascinating figure. There are over 4 million wooden utility poles being replaced annually. That's not the number of poles. That's the number of poles being replaced. And they all need a preservative so that they don't rot out in the ground within a very short time. So this Penta product is uh, one of the chemicals that they acquired from KMG in the acquisition. Next slide. Uh, I like that uh, there was a disruption in the force uh, when the acquisition was taking place. The quality took a little bit of a hit, but I like since the acquisition that the quality has climbed right back up to above 80, and it continues to move in an upward direction. I like the fact that the tail end of this graph on the red line is near historic highs. That means returns for these companies, for this company, is near uh, the highest that it's been for the last four or five years. Uh, those two things together make this something I'm really interested in. Next slide, please. Um, uh, value line suggests that sales might grow by at least 16%. Earnings might grow by at least 21% in the next three to five year period. Uh, you'll notice that manifest, uh, the analyst call is around 13.5%. That's a little bit lower than the value line call. Uh, next slide, please. I certainly like the lines. I don't see very much not 
uh, to like. And uh, since the acquisition uh, uh, occurred in the 17 fiscal year, we do see that the company has begun to grow uh, in a more robust fashion. The most recent quarter uh, was especially good quarter. You can see the growth numbers off to the right. Uh, I Again, not much not to like in uh, the growth of either sales or earnings. Next slide. I'm looking at the top and I've estimated historical sales growth going forward at 15% uh, based on the preferred procedure. I'm coming up with earnings growth at about 17%. Those numbers are both in line with value line numbers. They're a little bit more robust than the numbers that the analyst gave to Mark in, in his analysis. Uh, I would think that as this acquisition gets built into the different models, that the analyst community numbers uh, might go up a little bit as well. I'm getting nice green um, uh, trends on pre-tax profit, return on equity, and debt to capital. I will say that there is some debt on the books now uh, in the 2019 fiscal year, which is not showing up on the numbers here because these end at 2018 fiscal year. And that debt is coming primarily from the acquisition of KMG Chemical. Uh, the company has made it quite clear that they intend to uh, bring that debt down as quickly as they can. And you'll notice that the company has a history of, of running extremely low debt and then moving their debt up to make an acquisition, and then within four or five years, moving it right back down again so that it can make the next acquisition. My PAR number is a little bit more robust than the PAR coming from Manifest. I was using an average PE of around 20. Uh, Manifest was using an average PE just slightly below that. Uh, whether it's 11.6 or 13.4, I think those numbers are close enough, especially when we're drawing with crayons. And just like Nick, uh, I like to look at the two numbers, the 13.4 and the 17.1 coming from the uh, SSG. And I like to think of my return somewhere within that particular range. Certainly that's a decent range for a company that is selling about $600 million uh, worth of materials. That would be small in what we're talking about, uh, growth rate around 12% or better. Next slide. Oh, and so my suggestion is to add that uh, Cabot Microelectronics to the portfolio. Okay, thanks, Ken. I was just on the phone with my Ameritrade trade broker uh, buying shares of. No, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm both, sorry. right? Of both. <laughs> no, no, I gotta. We got two more to go. Oh, I mean, okay. I mean to, to bias the audience. All right, Kim is going to talk to us about La Quinta. And Kim, as a forewarning, I did not get your last couple of slides, so you'll have to until after we got started. You're still muted on your end, I think. Kim, I hope we didn't lose her. It's not hurricane season in Florida. No. Uh, Kim, uh, would you try to unmute on your end, please? Uh, I just disconnected and reconnected, and it worked. There we are. We can okay. hear you now. Okay. Take okay. it away. Okay. Um, this I'm talking about is Core Point Lodging. Uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago, I did a presentation on Wyndham Hotels, and it had been a recent spinoff. Well, Core Point Lodging is another part of that spinoff. They took all the La Quinta hotels and put them into a REIT, and they named this new entity Core Point Holdings. Um, this presentation Mark can put on the manifest uh, forum. Um, I had found, I had been following Core Point Lodging, and I, the first thing I have to admit is everybody has a stock in their portfolio that doesn't just follow the SSG. 
um, that it's our little bit of uh, play non money. Non-core. Non-core. It's play. <laughs> it's because you think it's going to, you know, it may just blow it out of the park. Um, core point lodging is all of the hotels from La Quinta in there, and they have got a, a business plan of uh, some strategic ways that they're going to increase the returns on their hotels because they have designated some of their hotel, hotels core and non-core. So the write-up that uh, you see here was put in um, Guru Focus, and it talks about why they really think it could be a compelling value because Blackstone owns 29% of this company. Now, many of you may not know Sicon Asset Management, but how many of you know Michael Burry from the Big Short and he predicted the housing uh, collapse? Turns out uh, Core Point Holding is his number one position in his portfolio. Uh, Fidelity Event Driven Opportunities Fund also owns this stock and they looked for stocks with major catalysts that can come about to really uh, give them great returns. Now, I believe it trades to as along with this uh, student value fund they, uh, it, it currently is undervalued. Um, it trades at a book value of about 0.5. And uh, in comparison to some of the other uh, stocks within this industry, it's trading at a much lower value. So I think it's a hidden gem. Uh, it's one of those things that Anytime I was told that you have a stock, if you can find a stock that is undervalued and no one is following it, there's only one analyst that's following this stock. And it's from JP, JP Morgan. And I'll show you later as to the, uh, the big institutionals are majorly in this stock. And ironically, the only analyst that's following the stock is not the number one holding. It's not from BlackRock. Uh, Spitoffs also are a uh, way that you can invest and you can make a lot of money. Any of you who've gotten S&P Global, that was a spinoff. It's done quite well at a 52 high this week. PayPal, another spinoff, 52 week high. Um, it's probably, I'm thinking, 50% undervalued and the management have got some major incentives to have it do well. It's got a nice dividend, so as we sit back and wait, a 6% dividend as you sit back and wait so it can go up 50% in value, that's not too bad. It gives you a good mar margin of safety. Next slide. Here's that background. CorePoint did not start trading until May 31st. Wyndham Worldwide acquired all the La Quinta hotels, and then it spun off into three different stocks. Wyndham Destinations, which was the timeshare area, Wyndham Hotels, which is an asset light uh, business where they do all the management of the uh, reservation systems, managing um, the, uh, it's basically it's the reservation systems, managing the employees, payroll, all that kind of stuff. So it's asset light. It doesn't own the physical buildings. And CorePoint, they put all those physical buildings and all those hard assets into a REIT. And next slide. Here's a little background of it. There it all is. And this CorePoint is also is basically in the mid category of hotels. Next slide. Uh, here is where the summary of multiples from that presentation Mark can put on the forum. If you look here in the middle, you can see the market cap is $4.3 uh, and it's equal to a lot of the others and half as much. But look at the price for, from future funds of operations is only 5.5, 5.6. And so the premium comps, it's down 54%. Next slide. 
Here's the ownership of the stock, Michael Burry. I got this off of Insider Monkey. Here are his top three holdings that he has. Core point holding, core point lodging. So ultimately, that makes me think that the guy who could predict the housing collapse has got something I'll always learn from that guy. So there you go. Next slide. Uh, here is the the next slide of who the uh, top institutional holders. If you'll notice, the first one is Blackstone at 29%. FMR is essentially Fidelity, 15%. Vanguard, 8.27. JP Morgan Chase is at 5.67. BlackRock, 5.26. State Street. Now, D.E. Shaw above is where um, he's established a stake in it in March. That's not too long ago. D.E. Shaw is one of those companies that is a um, deep, deep value portfolio manager. So anytime that they've got stocks in there, sometimes I like to snoop in to see what they have in their portfolio on their 13F filings because I have found some diamonds in the rough there. But if you add up what the top five holdings are, that's 30% plus 15 is 45 55, 63% top holders are the institutional. Now, that's quite a bit. And I've never seen an institution like Blackstone own 30% of it. Now, I do know on the board, they have two or three board members. And those board members are the strategic thinkers who run different indexes on real estate. So. I think they know something that's going on there of how this could be undervalued, and that's why they've got so many of the shares. Next slide. Top mutual fund holders are the Fidelity Event Driven Opportunities Fund. This is one of those funds that you can go snooping and find great possibilities for stocks for you because they have uh, stocks in there that they have figured out what they believe are the catalysts to make the stock price really go up. So you've got Vanguard, Fidelity, Small Cap. Kind of makes you wonder, what do they know? What have they figured out? Next slide. Uh, these catalysts that are in place, this um, mid to high range hotels, these are those hotels that offer the free food, free parking, free breakfast, free Wi-Fi. Uh, wi and they are able to get a lot more um, reservations this way. And now CorePoint is using Wyndham Hotel's reservation system, and they haven't got all that synergy together so that they are using the Wyndham platform to be able to get more reservation from third parties so that they'll have their hotels used more often. Um, this is what that value, that student fund, how they feel it's uh, going to be a good choice because of the logic space and where it's going to be. Another catalyst that they have in place is they authorized a $50 million buyback in shares on March the 21st. And they are also another catalyst is they are repositioning some of the hotels that they have in their group because they've had 15, 17 hotels that were impacted by the hurricanes that hit Florida and Texas. And they're getting insurance process money from the insurance companies and then they're remodeling those hotels. And not all of them are online yet. As well as they have, uh, they have just determined out of their 315 hotels, about 73 of them are considered non-core because the margins are not fat enough for them. They have a certain percentage of their hotels that have got a greater than 30% margin, profit margin. And these other non-core ones have very low margins. And they've already sold off two of those and got proceeds, uh, proceeds of over $4 million. And they pay, went, that went directly to pay down the debt. Um, next slide. Uh, I think. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Um, if you've got extra slides that you'd you'd give it to me, Kim, I'll make sure they're part of the the set that goes in, onto the into okay. the show notes. So one of the slides at the very uh, end goes, hmm, the book value, the stock, uh, the stock today closed at 1250. The book value by Morningstar and Yahoo says it's worth like 2150. Right there, you've got something going on that you've got a discrepancy in what the value is. You've got major deep value guys who are deep into the stock and have a lot of shares. That's something going on there. They've already announced that they're gonna buy back $50 million worth of shares. They have some majorly pretty good incentives for the management team um, for bonuses. The other thing is in following the management team, I've noticed that uh, the managers are getting their shares selling shares only to pay their taxes and they keep reinvesting their shares into the amount of shares that they have. So insiders are hanging on to what they've got. Somehow I have to feel within the next year, two years, they're going to be some event driven thing so that this company of core point is going to finally reach its full value. Another raise of 50% in two years, maybe. And it's not too shabby to get a dividend as we wait because it's over 6%. And so core point lodging is my stock recommendation. It's my play money. And every now and again, you got to have one in your portfolio. So I hope you'll consider it for your portfolio. Sure. All right. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, and it's a good segue into talking about Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett because one of the things that Benjamin Graham liked to do is buy companies that were sharply below their uh, listed book value. Now, Buffett took that to a new level, and that's what we'll talk about here for a few minutes. I'm going to just rather quickly go through. My my company is Supernus Pharma. Uh, you can see that uh, especially the last four data points on those charts is pretty spectacular, plus the price bars are pretty well behaved over the last few years. So let's talk a little bit about Supernus Pharma. We get to Supernus by going through Warren Buffett. I did not expect this to happen. I've been doing some work on small company investing, studying fairly closely the investments during his first 10 years as a 20-something investor. And a lot of those details are in Snowball. I know, I know many of you have probably read the book, um, but he talks about life and investing as, you know, you basically find a hill in the snowball, wet snow, and it can be a whole lot of fun from there. Um, in talking about shopping with Buffett, I, for years I've been talking about how Benjamin Graham taught him how to invest, and that, that's not really completely true. I'm going to have to change my words. He definitely influenced him a great deal, but you can also make the case that Phil Fisher, as a growth investor, kind of fine-tuned uh, what Benjamin Graham and the deep value side of the, uh, the house started, and Buffett is actually a blend of the investing styles of those two uh, uh, giants of investing. And he talked about basically these three elements. Kim's going to like these. Uh, point number one, find solid, well-managed companies. That's something that we like to do, too. Make sure that they have opportunities to succeed. He also is always on the lookout for uh, an attractive price, a price which was priced below what someone else would call a fair price or the intrinsic value of the company. And he targeted and, and uh, wanted companies that achieved a better return on capital. Again, and that's versus their peers and competitors. This should sound fairly familiar and compared to some of the other stuff that we do. So this is almost a triple play type mentality of uh, things that, that Buffett looks for in stock. So let's talk about a solid, well-managed company. I think we can do that by isolating the high quality, excellent companies and financial strengths that are in the upper half, perhaps the upper upper third of all companies that we follow. Keep in mind that when Value Line talks about financial strength, they do are talking about product portfolio and uh, uh, that type of stuff and market potential going forward. So it's not limited to just the balance sheet. It does include some other stuff. Second, and again, I don't want to go too deep into this other than to say I have show, showed my work here. You can actually convert Buffett's uh, quest for an intrinsic value bargain 
when compared to the market price and convert that using the mathematics that are shown here. Now, Ken said, be a bunch of, don't, don't inundate Ken with questions in the back room. But this is basically what it comes down to. He's trying to find a, a stock that is priced at 50% of its fair value or it's an intrinsic value. And uh, as the math shows here, he's talking about seeking return forecasts that are in the mid-20s. So that's what this slide boils down to. He's out there looking for really dynamic, powerful opportunities, and not just any hot, high flyer. It's got to be a high-quality stock on top of that, and there's a major difference. We're not talking about buying bargain basement stuff here that's low quality, high quality with exceptional returns. And then this notion of achieving a better return on capital, again, return on total capital, equity, and debt is very industry specific. So you want to always be checking back to make sure that they're good managers of capital, whether they choose one of those two routes. And as stock investors, we really do want uh, more equity than debt in our, uh, in our big, bigger picture. So where do we end up? You run a quick screen. You're looking for companies with a, a return forecast, a projected annual return above 20. Note that Nick was kind of getting there with some of his stuff early on in the session. And then I just left it at an excellent quality rating. You end up with three companies. Okay, and uh, what, what we do notice about some of these is the financial strengths are a little bit lower, the earning stability are a little bit lower, but these are fairly <laughs> promising companies. Again, we just shed this one, but again, as I said earlier, it's, it's still a great company, may return to the portfolio. Um, but of the three, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to Supernus Pharma for this reason. If you look at the specialty and generic drug industry group, Supernus is actually up towards the top. That means it's got, uh, again, among its peers and competitors, uh, higher profitability and probably a pretty solid return on total capital. Here's another way to look for some of the stuff that he's talking about. You could do this at Morningstar, searching for uh, this final column over here, sorted from lowest to highest. And I'm using not the Morningstar, but the analyst consensus estimates for the price versus the fair value. So, again, Supernus is the most on sale amongst these companies. These are excellent quality companies or good quality companies that uh, are potentially on sale and almost to the levels that Buffett would be looking for. But, again, those 50% opportunities Again, 26%, 30% uh, return forecasts actually are fairly rare. That's why Buffett says you wait for the pitch. Wait for the pitch. I do find it interesting that Walgreen has snuck back onto this list. I'll leave it at that for now. All right, what do these guys do? They are uh, a fairly formidable small company that's in a, in a fairly specialized area right now. That area is epilepsy. Uh, there are two major drugs, both deal with epilepsy that you see up here at the top. And uh, one of them is being tried in the, in the realm of migraine uh, prevention. And they actually you do do some work for some of these other companies on the chart. Now, the reason that this could be important is for, you know, future development, potential uh, acquisition type activity, that sort of thing. So they're out there and they're pretty well leveraged. Those two, two drugs are actually performing fairly well. They actually have a fairly, a fairly intriguing pipeline. CNS stands for central nervous system, and they are working in the areas of ADHD, impulsive aggression, bipolar, and again, they already are working in the area of epilepsy, but uh, some, some very powerful areas. Again, when you put it in the context of um, basically one out of every three or four people that you meet uh, struggles in some way with mental health at some point. So it's a, it's a huge challenge, and they are providing some solutions to that, attempting to provide more. Here's a price chart over the last several years. You can see that they've steadily progressed up into the, the 50s and 60s and relaxed back down into the 40 range. Uh, here are some of the more of the financials, and again, I'm not going to dig in too deeply other than to say for an emerging company that's really just kind of rolling and getting started, they actually have some pretty good numbers and uh, a bit of a track record already and uh, some pretty reliable and good trends when it comes to the epilepsy medications that they're taking, that they're, that they're issuing now. So here's a closer look. Again, we're talking about a $400 million company that's predominantly those epilepsy medications uh, growing on, uh, 
15% or so. You can see that the lines are pretty good. Um, the work that they're doing right now, the, the final stage testing on ADHD type applications isn't going that well. We they expect to, to have a little bit of a pricing doldrum situation here in the next few weeks. We'll see if that actually pans out. Well, we are talking about a company with relatively high margins. Again, in their industry, um, you know, anywhere in this in this realm is is pretty good, and they seem headed that that direction. Um, the PE ratio at 16 is actually fairly conservative if they are successful and 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 pull off some of the pipeline stuff that there is a lot of promise for. We are looking at high teen profit margins, and uh, I, I don't think it's too tough to see a, a mid teens to high teens PE ratio based on this type of a, a look for a company at their position in their life cycle. So I think that's it for me. I'm going to recommend that we go ahead with this one. And, and again, we'll be doing more work on the, the hunting style of one Warren Buffett and some of the others in his camp. But uh, we'll hope for the best from Supernus, and hopefully their Phase 3 FDA stuff will, will go well along with our Delixes. So with that, Ken, I think we can go ahead and switch to... Uh, a poll and it's up on your screen right now folks uh, here's the four stocks we presented this evening uh, you can choose none of them or one of them and uh, give yourself a chance to vote there and we'll see how how things uh, move through I'm gonna give you about another 20 seconds or so to vote we're up to 75 percent voting up to 85 let's give you about four more seconds that went past the oh i thought i was going to go right past 90 there it's there it goes went past 90 so i'm going to close uh the poll and share the results and it looks like we're going to put a uh an ameritrade uh two uh ameritrades into the portfolio td ameritrades sounds good I like it. And we liked all the other three pretty well there. Uh, they they were roughly, or, or the, the Cabot and Core Point were in line with each other, and uh, we're all set. Oh, um, you're, Mark, you're, just try, to, you're just trying to be nice. I only got 7%. But I, I, I didn't I, say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's definitely worth taking a closer look at that company. And we'll okay, uh, I'm going to uh, check our question box here, Mark, while you show folks uh, where we're going to be in the near future here. Okay, so while Ken's checking questions, uh, we will be with Nick Stratagos on Saturday with Nick and his friends. Hopefully we'll find a place to hold the session. But we'll be we, we have a place. Day. Okay, good deal. We really look forward to that. We have a great time with the Pittsburgh audiences a few weeks after that, we will all be in Chicago, including Hugh McManus and Cy Lynch, Nick and Kim, for that uh, multi-day event where we basically do this 24-7 for a few days and have a lot of fun. The May Investing Roundtable is on May 28th. That's the day after Memorial Day, I believe. Ken and I will be up in Traverse City for uh, basically a club jamboree. Uh, we get a bunch of clubs together and just basically have a blast. Our next investing topics will be... Uh, uh, Turnout Tuesday on June 4th. That's likely to be about the, some of the small company stuff I've been exploring and how I somehow ended up uh, reading four books on, books on Warren Buffett last week. Um, I'll be in Boston on June 15th for a session of the American Association of Investors. Really looking forward to that. The presentation will key around that founder's wisdom theme that we've presented a few times. And then a week later, June 22nd, Columbia, South Carolina. Really looking forward to that one. Those folks have been uh, very effective supporters over the years, and I've had a lot of fun. Look forward to meeting some of them and having a good time with them down there. The June roundtable is on the 25th of June, and uh, Ken and I will both be in Oklahoma City on August 17th. And we wind out the, the summer months anyhow with Kim and Ken and Cy, in Atlanta for their August 24th event in Atlanta. And 
uh, they put on a real nice show in Atlanta. And I'm, I'd like to sneak in and, and watch some of that one. So with that, you can uh, go ahead and check out uh, the events menus at the chapters at the Better Investing website. And then we also keep uh, some events at the Manifest Investing website. So with that, Ken, I think... Uh, well, Mark, all we have is a few comments. Uh, Michael Campbell says he's owned Supernus uh, since 2015, so you have a supporter in the audience. And Joe Whitaker just uh, typed a very cryptic uh, comment. He says, Rhino with a question mark. Joe, I'm not sure whether you want to know what we mean by Rhino or whether you're uh, making disparaging <laughs> remarks about a rhino. Uh, rhino basically is the affectionate term that Mark has used in, uh, used in a lot of his writings uh, about the analyst and the analyst community, and it has to do with uh, how fast they can run and how far they can see. They can run really fast and they can't see hardly at all. So uh, it's just an affectionate uh, term that he uses uh, when he's talking about the analyst community. Uh, with that, I've cleared the question marks out. I don't seem to have any hands uh, raised. I'll, I'll count to five and make sure that's true. Uh, no, the hands have stayed down. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, we'll uh, hope to see you again uh, at our next event. Thank you, folks. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone.